All right, good morning. Uh, the next training we're going to have is on ethics and boundaries in the workplace. This one is focused on dual relationships and oversight disclosure. Okay? Um, and this is going to be really difficult for me to do didactic because there's a lot of questions, so I'll repeat um, if, if, you know, there's one or two that are, you know, tie in with this. Okay? Because we've got probably an hour or so. So, how many people have a training on ethics and boundaries? Okay. We also have a whole course in our Act program on ethics and boundaries because um, it's inherent in everything we do. It's inherent in everything we do as far as our interactions with clients and our interactions with other employees and with supervisors, and that's going to that's going to be the focus uh, with this training. Okay. <clears throat> Why did you choose to work in behavioral health? You know it's not the money, right? Why did people choose this? To help others, right? To give back, to make a difference. That's usually what comes into play. This passion is important, and we wouldn't have an industry anywhere, right? And there's been, um, one of the things I do want to mention at this point, because it ties into, it ties in to um, the passion we have as caregivers, right? Um, the tendency for caregivers, where any, anybody works, is to do that. And a lot of times we don't take care of ourselves. So that's what I want to talk a little bit about today. Okay? Because there is that tendency. And a lot of times as an industry, we don't take care of ourselves. So when you're out there, if you happen to have access to emails, we do a lot of political advocacy around funding and other things on both the state and federal level. And you will get emails on that. Probably more than you care. Once in a while, try to hit that, okay? I want to mention Daniel Mumbrauer, our CEO, who started as the Director of Dietary at Plymouth. He doesn't like me speaking about him. He's a very humble gentleman. Um, but one of the things that he is involved with, as many of our management group, is to go out and do advocacy. So you may get emails saying, this, this um, uh, bill is up. You know, can you hit the button and say you'd like it to pass as far as funding or what have you the case may be. Um, <clears throat> we take bus loads up to the rallies, political uh, rallies in Boston, clients, staff. I'm sure some of you may have gone with other agencies. Daniel, every year or so, um, takes staff to Washington, D.C., rents a community center and go in and visit the Senate. Houses, uh, the representatives to advocate for funding. Um, so, I know when I started doing payroll here, <laughs> I would say, oh my God, I don't have time to look at these. I don't even know who my representative is. So when you get the monthly employee newsletter, you'll see a lot of times statements around what's going on. Um, and once in a while, try to hit that button because if we don't try, no, you know, we're not going to have that. And we've seen funding released and we've seen changes. So, bit by bit, there's a lot of talk about helping us, right? Our industry. But it's very hard to get the funds to filter down. So that's my little soapbox thing on um, advocacy. Now, there are traits from individuals' life experience, staff's cultural background, that are brought to the table. Now we need empathy, right? We want to have empathy with clients. We should try to have empathy with other employees, right? For most staff, they want to be altruistic or to give back to the greater good. Um, we have to have negotiation skills. We negotiate all the time, all day long, um, because there's conflicts, there's difference of opinion, okay? And what those can be is we can be negotiating with other employees. We obviously negotiate with clients. 
okay? We negotiate with payers if anyone does utilization review. Um, we may, may be negotiating with family members, supervisors, and that's okay because look at everybody's background. If you have a treatment team meeting when you're d discussing what is in the best interests of the client, having a variety of point of view is good based on experience, right? And sometimes people say we negotiate with ourselves. Should I said that? Should I not have said that? Why didn't I say that? Right? I've had staff say, you know, Ann, when I, go, when I go home at night, I don't want to make any decisions. No decisions. This is self-care. I don't want to, I don't want to know. Is it red or green? I don't want to. I don't want to make any more decisions because what we do is emotionally, mentally draining. And anyone, especially if you're starting, if you try to, you know, explain it to them, they will not understand. So this also will tie in to self-care. And you'll talk about more about this on Wednesday when you do Crisis Prevention Institute training, which is all about staff's interactions with clients and reducing escalation. A lot of this has to do with employees taking care of themselves. A lot of it. Now, if you look on a scale of 1 to 10, I like scales, for those people in the caregiving capacity, and whether it's here in behavioral health, whether it's in a medical setting, whether it's with, um, you know, police, uh, fire uh, people, I can't say firemen anymore, so I'm politically correct. Um, they're able to handle a lot of stress. We're able to handle a lot of stress. And then again, on a scale of 1 to 10, people usually say it's about an 8 or a 10, or some people say 12. Okay? And I don't know about you, but sometimes you go through that day where it's just one stressor after another, one crisis after another, and then you're, you're, you're driving home, and it's, it's like you just got spit out of a tornado. Yes? <laughs> and that's why it's good for self-care. Because I see, and I'll put my HR hat on, that we all have stress saturation points, whatever those numbers are. And if we look at the stress inverted curve, stress is very motivating on this size. We can use it. It gets us through those situations during the day where after we were emotionally drained or exhausted. Okay? But on the other side, after that saturation point is continually, you know, I always say, after that saturation has been met, okay, it becomes distress for employees. It's a negative consequence. So what's really important is this tie into self-care. And I, you know, the sometimes, you know, the importance of doing things like taking vacation. A lot of times, if I'm dealing with a staff member who's extremely uh, maybe they're in crisis, maybe they're very stressed out. Sometimes, or, or staff are in conflict, I'll say, when is the last time you took a vacation? Right? <laughs> right. Now, we have a very generous time benefit policy. Take your books home and look at your leave time policy. Very generous. People who are 80 hours per pay period, budgeted, right? Three weeks the first year. And every year it rises. And there are two constants working with clients or patients. One is, are we short staffed? Yes. Okay. The other is, clients are always needy. The only variable is, the, is us. Right. And so people will say, and it's re actually, we had to put in the handbook that staff are required, if they're at that level of 80 hours per pay period, to take two weeks a year. Now, you go into industry or corporate America, everybody's taking their vacation. You're in behavioral health, they may have a tendency not to. 
and not taking just days here or there to take care of somebody else, because a lot of times we're in that role, but taking like a week off or two weeks off. Because those two constants will not change, whether we're here or not. The short staffed, <laughs> then you get the flu going around or whatever, right? So you've experienced that. And so when you get into the training on Wednesday, they're going to talk about how you take care of yourself. And talk to individuals who've been doing this 5, 10, 15 years and ask them how they do it. And a lot of times it's around that. It can be during the day, you, you, you get out of the facility, you take a break, you, you change the reality. Staff can get too enmeshed in the drama, you seen that, in settings. This becomes their life. Or staff may not take care of themselves on the outside like they previously did. Now, we have many staff around, across the state, especially working in addictions, that have life experience with addictions. Okay? And I've seen staff, and I've spoke to staff who said, well, I stopped doing my outside supports because I'm talking about this all day, or I'm doing this all day, or I know about this. And we've had staff who have had difficulties with their recovery. And they're usually referred to <coughs> get professional help. And we've had staff who have not taken advantage of outside supports they had before and didn't make it. And some of the most um, wonderful individuals working in the field did not make it. Right? So this is my little, my second soapbox on self-care. How do people take care of themselves? <laughs> How do you take care of yourselves before work, during work, after work? What do you do for the stress? Exercise. Exercise. Meditate. Meditate. Sleep. Sleep. <laughs> yes. Eating well. What? Eating well. Eating well. Yep. Sleeping well, meditating, yoga, all these. We just had a yoga series for staff in New Bedford. It's been great, right? Um, some people say music, prayer, um, changing the reality, having pictures of their, their children or pets around where clients can't see them. Something to get us out. This is not our reality. Or self-talk, okay? Which is very helpful for people. So... I don't know if you've seen that, but sometimes we talk about the, the, the staff conflicts, all right, and um, staff who like to create drama. Anybody see that? Right? Ever see that? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, they have a, a stress saturation of 15, but it's like we don't have enough. Right? And some staff need a little more support or consultation on dealing with large systems. Some people are coming in, they haven't worked for a while. They don't know how to take care or advocate for themselves. And that's okay to ask for help with that. And over self-disclosure. So, I'm going to have the next two slides are going to be the same questions. This slide is related to the supervisor-employee relationship. The next slide is employee-to-employee. -employee. Then we'll get into some ethics and boundaries with clients, which are very important. And I will say many individuals, not due to ill intent, a lot of times cultural things, will have difficulty with, with the demands of thinking things through ethically. No. Or taking action. Right. So, some of the responses, because this is very interactive, is um, people will say, first question, is it okay for an employee to disclose personal information with a supervisor? Sometimes people say yes. Sometimes people say absolutely not, maybe based on their experience. Some people say depends. Okay? Um, but we all need to use discretion. Now, hiring supervisors, wherever you go, cannot ask any diagnostic questions. Do you have a medical condition? Can you tell me what, what it is? 
Do you have a diagnosis for alcohol and drugs? All these are illegal against the American Disabilities Act. Okay. Um, do you have a psychiatric diagnosis? What they can ask is, are you capable of performing your job? Right? Which we all get that little sheet, lifting, dragging, whatever we have to do. Okay. So, again, there may be a tendency, I think, more in the addiction field than I've seen in other industries, where people will self-disclose around their addiction history, which is not unusual. We have a lot of resumes come in, and individuals will say, well, if you look at my resume, I don't have any experience with this, but I have life experience. It's impacted me. It's impacted my family. It's impacted my child. It's impacted the community. So what do I put on my resume? Yeah. And I say, use discretion, because some resumes come in, there's too much information too much personal information, and it may not be necessary. Because I know if I send that out to a few program directors, they're going to say a little too information, too much information. But a lot of this may have to do with the cultural background of staff who are coming in, who may be, have been exposed and have found supports within anonymous programs or 12-step programs that are all about self-disclosure. So it's hard to come into a system and not do that, all right? And that's what we see, and it's not just here, it's across the state, because we sit on a lot of those HR committees and things. So it's where's the fine line, and when do I or when do I not, right? Because it can come back to cause some difficulty. Say I'm a supervisor, and I'm going to be a good supervisor. Say I'm a good, real good supervisor, the best supervisor. What else can I say? Say I'm a good supervisor, and a staff person comes in who's disclosed to me, and I don't like to know any information about anybody um, if I was in a direct supervisory capacity um, or an HR capacity. But say they say, oh, my gosh, you know, I've, you know, been abstinent for a while, da-da-da, da-da-da, but I hear this new medication that's being prescribed, you know, the clients are, you know, misusing it, and I hear what happens, sounds pretty enticing, I'm glad it wasn't around when I was out there, because I might not make it back, right, I may not be here today. No, they could just be talking or venting, but if my med cabinet's missing that med the next day, what am I going to think about? Even I got to work through the bias, but you see what I'm saying. Um, so I always say, when in doubt, don't use discretion, use timing. It depends on the relationship with the supervisor, right? And I'm sure some of you have found that it's come back mm -hmm. negatively, right? And some of you, it's worked fairly well. Um, now, after I finish this. Which is in a half an hour. Um, our benefits coordinator is going to talk to you, and she'll tell you. People go on on medical leave or military leave or family leave, whatever, personal leave. That no one knows about that except Janine, the benefits coordinator. No supervisor knows it. Her office is next to mine. I don't know why anybody's out. I don't want to know why anybody's out. You see what I'm saying? This is covered under HIPAA. Right? Just like when we go to the docks. Right? So also, it's not okay for a supervisor to self-disclose. It puts employees in a very precarious situation. If we have concerns that our supervisor, whose sphere of influence is larger, not able to make um, healthy decisions or professional decisions, we have a duty to warn situation. Tough stuff for an employee. And we have a duty to warn you, you're gonna find, you know, the duty to warn with the clients if they're at risk of hurting themselves or others. We also have um, in, in our anti-violence policy and in, in your handbook that we have a duty to report if we're concerned about someone else's safety or that of the clients. You know. Um, Supervisors should not be socializing with one or two employees because everybody else is going to be looking at it, right? 
We have a large winter party every year to recognize staff. Everybody's invited. We had about 400 people last year. Um, obviously, they should not be disclosing any information. And supervisors, and it's in the handbook, are not allowed to date employees. Isn't that wonderful? It's a wonderful thing. Now, we have people who are married. We have people who choose to date. But if one is directly or indirectly supervising or provides information around their, that staff performance, they have to make a change. One of them has to make a change, work at a different program, work at a different site. Okay? Now, we're going to go in to the next one. Same thing. Answer can be yes or no. Is it okay for an employee to disclose personal information to an employee? And even here, I've got heads yes. Heads no. Can't come back, especially if there's conflict between employees. Okay? Um, no one should be discussing personal information or rumors with other employees. That can be devastating. It can impact a staff's credibility. It could, you know, you know if I tell you something, by the time it's in the hall, um, you know, we, we got the state troopers in. I don't know. So we have to be very careful um, around that, and it's, it's not allowed. This gossip or call-ins, call um, maybe to a super HR, um, I've had anonymous calls, and, they, and I said, no, I can't, I can't indicate that I'll be able to keep this confidential if someone's at risk, you know, and I don't want to know all this personal information. Just, no. <laughs> I don't want to know, because once you know, you know. And once you share that information with an employee, employees come and go, and they go with your information, right? So use discretion. Um, obviously, employees should get really tight with people. We've got similar value systems. There's going to be socialization. Employees can date other employees. We've got many discussions about this. There's no bullet that you can't, but we're so large. Any relationship. Whether it's friends or dating, if it's not impacting work performance, it's not a concern. If there are employees dating, we all know there can be some conflictual situations, or the uh, the employment relation <laughs> could be, or the, the 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 they break up. Yes, you've seen that. Not good stuff in the workplace. Right. create drama, bring other people into it. Nope. Impact in the workplace. Sometimes supervisor calls is not something real tangible, but it's like creating um, you know, negativity within my program because people are all concerned about this. It's not impacting, it's not impacting. So that can be discussed with them. All right? Um, patience. We think the important thing to know is that we cannot have a dual relationship with a client, whether they're with us or after they've left us. And a dual relationship with clients means we're out of our professional capacity. And there's some other relationship that's going on, whether it's initiated by the client and allowed by the staff or initiated by the staff, that's a huge ethical issue. Okay. First thing that would be helpful when you go to your sites, make sure you get a copy of the residency guidelines or rules or regs of the population you're servicing. Because we can't set up the boundaries for the clients if we don't know what we can allow them or not allow them to do. Right? So make sure you get a copy of that. Because clients are going to know about it, but you may not know about it. Because we know if one client is allowed to do this and 15 others aren't allowed to do this, what happens? All heck breaks loose, right? Favoritism, I'm being discriminated against, I'm the odd person out again, and that is what they've experienced probably their whole life. So it replicates that. Um, and we try to model, right, professional, mature behavior. 
We can't do it perfectly. I can't do it perfectly, but we continue to strive to do that. So don't be too hard on yourself. My primitive drawing. It parallels ethics and boundaries in the program, parallels our own individual value systems, right? We get up in the morning, we try to do things or not do things based on our value system. Some days we do really well, some days not so well. But we may set up boundaries to help ourselves. I don't know, for instance, someone who doesn't, uh, someone who doesn't want to swear may not hang out with people who swear. May not watch shows where there's a lot of swearing. I don't know. And the same thing is in regards to the program. So when you go to work in a program, or your department, or in the dietary, you know, you've got to do the portion control, and if there's feeling that someone's getting more than the other, there's going to be conflict. Someone's getting um, more supplies than the other one, there's going to be conflict. Um, some staff, say, in the box are saying, you know, really, I'm sorry, I can't allow you to do that. No. Because if I allow you to do that, I have to allow everybody to do that, and we're not supposed to. And the clients will push and push and push and try to get their needs met. Right. And maybe the staff person outside of the box is saying, yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Or go ahead and don't tell anybody. That's even better. That reminds them of some stuff that happened in their background, right? Um, or maybe, as someone brought to my attention, all the staff here been around for a while and are just burnt out from keeping that boundary. Right. And that's significant as well. Didn't need to get into that. There's more stressors when there's more such starting a new job, very stressful. You know, what can I do for the client, not do for a client? Maybe different on the first shift, second shift, third shift. Maybe different if staff are working at two different programs. Right? I go to this program, I'm allowed to do that. I go to that program, I'm not allowed to do that. Very confusing. So we say to try to keep with one for a while. Like I said. Clients are wanting, they, get their, they want to get their needs met. They want to feel special. They want to leave treatment. They want to sabotage treatment. They want to leave treatment. So say why they want to leave treatment. They've been calling for days to get a bed, right? Days. Then they finally get one, and they either don't show or they leave. Right? Because they're afraid of failing. They're afraid of succeeding. They're, they want to use. And sometimes they'll sabotage treatment because there may have be too much dependency with that client and that program or the staff person. And they may want to sabotage, and sometimes at the end of treatment, because they don't know how to end a healthy relationship. Right? They usually will reject before they're rejected. Especially on the other end, if they're having some disciplinary situations themselves. Okay? So, because staff will say, what, what, why, do they, why do they keep doing that? They're going to transfer blame on us, the food, the sheets, right? And usually the transference. from a client to us is not real positive a lot of times. You know, we work with a lot of schools, people are coming on um, new, you know, brand new position and they say, oh my god, I didn't expect that I would get all this negative energy on me. You know, and so again we need supervision with that because sometimes we can handle it and sometimes we get infiltrated. And that's hard to get all that negative energy when we're trying to give so much positive energy. Um, they're going to create drama. Okay. They're going to manipulate tremendous skill in manipulating 
and presenting situations with a very uh, different perception or experience. And they will try to go to the weakest link in the staff. Could be me. Right? Could be me. That's why we need help from each other. And why do they do these things? I don't say this on a negative. I say this from a strength point of view. Because a lot of them, based on their trauma history, will not be alive if they didn't have that skill set. They're able to manipulate on the street. They're able to get their needs. They're able, you know, do manipulate with families, systems. Um, they're able to, some of them are great salespeople. I know with our population, we'd have a client, think of one client, just one client, you know, major drug dealer for years, extremely successful to get caught. Great salesperson. You gotta be a good salesperson to do that, right? You gotta be able to manipulate, right? So you got in the vocational program, instead of saying, you know, you gotta go down here and do that, it was like, listen, let's look at the job match we do a little profile. Be great in sales. Right. Made a connection, went down to the uh, auto dealership. What do you think he did? Use that skill on the opposite side. Right. Then it presents a positive piece to them. What did you do right versus what you've done wrong? Okay? And a lot of times also, the perception that might be presented by staff may impact their shame and guilt. And from a strength-based point of view, it's not how many times did you relapse? But how many days were you able to abstain from alcohol, drugs, sexual promiscuity, purging, gambling? How many days were you able to maintain your medication regime? Re regime. Regime. What am I saying? Mm -hmm. Say the word. You know what I mean. Um, take care of your psychiatric diagnosis. And how did you do that? And to celebrate that versus the negative piece. Okay, so this is to celebrate the positive stuff. So, and this should be in the guidelines, a wonderful thing. If anybody comes in, we know, we immediately report it to our supervisor. And client needs to be pulled aside. If they know staff, they should not expect favors, because they will. They should not disclose information about employees. You know, I ran with you, I dated your sister, you know, whatever the case may be, they need to, that needs to be addressed immediately. That is not okay. Um, they are going to attempt to create a, that dual relationship, okay? They may be flirtatious, romantic, they may want to engage in a, a, a sexual interaction, a business interaction. You know, I do roofs when I get out of here. You know, do you need your roof done? I'll come over and do it for you. Or staff may think that, oh gosh, you know, they need money. They're a master mechanic. Right? When you leave here, why don't you come over? You can fix my car. No. <laughs> it's been dangerous. It has been dangerous. And we have had staff that just don't think outside that box a little bit. And some of, you know, we, we all make errors around that. And it's always, when in doubt, defer, right? Or when in doubt, ask. Okay? We can't bring anything in for them individually. We can't accept gifts from them individually. Right? We cannot provide clinical therapy if we're not trained. And staff have to be very careful not to impose their value system onto clients, or their method of recovery onto clients, because that's not individualized treatment. Some clients, as I have to do my disclaimer, this has nothing to do with my position on anonymous programs like AA, NA, OA, it's like 250 of them. OK? 
Okay. But if a staff person has found success with those programs, which 12 million people across the globe have, okay, that's a wonderful thing. But for some, um, for some clients, that model of treatment doesn't work. And sometimes when I'm able to ask this, this is who I hear from, from those, those, those people who are in new hire training. Sometimes clients may have difficulty in groups because they have uh, social phobia or anxiety. Sometimes clients do better individually. Sometimes we need to offer sort of a buffet of what's going to work for them and what's worked for them in the past. Some clients will say, I get triggered when I go. I've had my anonymity breached. Right. And sometimes even in this room we've had discussion where they have to try again and they have to try different meetings. But maybe, and I know we have to do, is give a, and I will do, I'll, here's some information, here's some meetings, here's some information on smart recovery, <clears throat> rational recovery. Some clients do online meetings. And I so think that doesn't count. It does count if it helps them. You see what I'm saying? We have to offer that. That's individualized. That's customized treatment. Okay. Um, we already talked about this. We're very careful around confidential confidentiality if we're working with clients in a program. You have a couple of milliseconds at the copy machine to give an update about this client or that. You have no idea who's overhearing you. Even the client, or even the, uh, <laughs> could be other clients, it could be the copy machine person. <laughs> and especially if we use jargon, which may for us sometimes be the most, the easiest thing to say instead of explaining everything. But if other clients are hearing that, it can be very demeaning because there's a sense that that's what's being said, like those terms chronic relapser which really put clients in a box and is demeaning. And a lot of this is outside. After they've left, they still could be in treatment, people working outpatient. Um, sometimes you see, you know, clients who are doing extremely well, right? They're out in the community, it's pouring rain, there's a blizzard, we drive by, as caregivers, we want to pick them up. I know I have. <clears throat> you can't. Changes the relationship. It's a safety issue. It's an expectation issue. Um, I know for a lot of my clients, they don't have their license. Well, it's a tough thing. Uh, we see them in the community, we don't acknowledge them. We don't obviously indicate that we've known them from here, there, or the other thing. A client, if they, or a former client, give us, you know, a, a, a want to acknowledge us or say hi, then we can respond. Okay, other than that, we may be the last person that they want to see, right? Especially if they're out um, back in their, in their um, negative environments. One of the things I want to mention around uh, maintaining our boundaries is we talked a little bit about staff really getting too enmeshed and sometimes being too hard on themselves. I would staff say, uh, recently we had um, an in-service training by our employee assistance program, and I want, I want to mention a bit, in regards to um, handling conflict in the workplace. And... Um, What came out after the training is one staff approached and said, you know, how long, I've just got this new person working, how long is it going to take them to get up to speed? I'm feeling very frustrated. I said, well, how long have they been there? <coughs> Three months. <laughs> and how long have you been there? Right? Five years. <laughs> Unrealistic expectation. And for anyone, I think it's a good year or two if you're just starting. Or I'll say, try to remember your first day on the job. Right? Sometimes you might even hear from managers, well, that's common sense. 
everybody's common sense is different. Try to remember your first day on the job. Anybody have a visual? <laughs> I remember mine. I didn't know what I was doing. Plopped in the middle of this facility. Didn't have any idea, thank goodness, for mentors. And I'm still learning. Aren't we still learning? All right. So be gentle with yourself, I'll say to staff. Just be gentle with yourself. <clears throat> now, I want to indicate that sometimes something else happens with staff. As you know, we talked about transference. It's when a client will assume who we are, or who we remind them of, or we rep represent authority, which is not going to be a, a positive experience for them in a lot of different places. Okay, so it's their negative, their anger. We have to look at another term, which is longer, called countertransference. Mm -hmm. This term means that when staff's cultural filters start impacting the client, and countertransference, we have to be very careful with. And sometimes that has to do with staff really needing to take a look at where that's coming from and to get support and the supervisor. I think this is so long to wait for lunch to quarter one because usually it's 12 o'clock, you're ready, right? Um, but I want to mention our employee assistance program. Now, has anybody worked at uh, anywhere that's had an employee assistance program? Most state and federal agencies are required to have some outside supports for staff, so there's not that dual relationship going on. Um, I did work for employee assistance programs for about five years, and I really enjoyed it. Um, and I knew that it was very helpful for employees to be able to speak with a professional outside of the work site on maybe some of these pieces <coughs> that are impacting their work. Okay. So I want to mention our EAP, and I think it's also in the handbook. Uh, they're called the EAP Network. Um, they've been around for about 25, 30 years. They cover about 25,000 employees in eastern New England. And what the EAP is, um, it's a confidential service that High Point pays by employee head, okay, for you or anybody you care for to seek confidential supports with any of their subcontracted professionals. They're not just giving us the referral like we could get at the back of the insurance card. So staff may have a need. Um, in regards to financial consult, a legal consult, support for a, a child, uh, couples work, individual work. They also have specialization in helping staff work more effectively or if they're having kind of transference issues or they're having any other need. They're referred out to get the support. All right. So I want to mention how important that is. Um, and that's available to you. And family is not defined, and they don't have any lists. All right. So, and we don't get any information, but a little pie chart every six months on the percentage of em employees or uh, people they care about. Um, they also do a lot of trainings, and they also work a lot with caregiving facilities, hospitals, like I said, police departments, fire departments, and are very adept at helping caregivers. So don't discount them as an option. Right. Our utilization rate is almost uh, triple of what the, the national standard is, so they must be doing a pretty good job. And they have offices everywhere. You know, they're not met with here. So, um, <clears throat> I want to mention social networking. Okay, We have a pretty... Um, lengthy policy in your handbook and you, you should uh, review it because this comes up a lot around ethics and boundaries. What's the easiest thing for me to indicate is we should not be doing anything electronically or through social media with a client that we wouldn't do face to face. That make sense? So if, you know, if, if there is interaction on Facebook 
okay? That's not okay. But you need to get supervision because there could be unique circumstances, like it's a family member or a spouse, <laughs> okay? But if a client tries to friend you or tries to interact or obtain um, maybe email, okay? You need to respond that, I, that this is, again, our ethics policy. Please do not attempt to do this again. Um, and that if you are at risk of hurting yourself or others, right, that you need to call 911. We're not doing electronic therapy. You see more behavioral health agencies doing that because there's such a staff shortage. You see, you see medical providers doing it. Um, we've seen a lot more psychiatrists or prescribers doing it because there's such a shortage. So they may meet with the client face-to-face, -face, but after, it's, it's through Skype, and all those disclosures have to be there. Because if a client is not given those proper disclosures and they are at risk or they do do something, it can be very litigious. And there's very big international um, requirements and, and national requirements around uh, e-therapy, electronic therapy. But those individuals who are working in, um, with clients in homes or, you know, with, as peers, then they may be doing more with high points encrypted cell phones. Um, and we have to make sure the contracts indicate that. Do not assume I'm monitoring this email 24-7, okay? And if you're at risk, okay? Also, if you're on Facebook or any social media that can be accessed, okay, if you are discussing your employer or high point and you're providing opinions around policies or protocols or whatever, you need to indicate, just like you see in the newspapers or on social media, that that is your personal opinion and not that of the organization, okay? Um, because we see that in newspapers again, that that can be difficult, all right? So I think that's it on ethics and boundaries. Okay. Any of that makes sense? <laughs>